My name is Mary. If you don't know me, I have been at LEA for about 13 years and my job there is director of education and I do um, a lot with our invasives prevention program. So invasive aquatic plants. And in my um, not so vast downtime, uh, spare time, I like to go on trips to see birds. So I just got back in January from a two week trip and this is the fourth time that I've been down there. So every time I go down, I have um, a little bit more adventure and see a few more birds. This last trip, I saw 171 new species for my life list. So that was something. Um, yeah, Paul, uh, it was, uh, that was quite the adventure. When you've been down someplace four times, you think, wow, oh, there's nothing new to see but there definitely was. So just a little, I don't know if everybody is aware of where Ecuador is. It's on mainland South America, high, high up in the Andes. And this is like a kind of a zoomed in map of the central part of Ecuador. And the orange is Quito. So that's where you fly in. It is the um, highest capital city. I think it's right on the equator. So it is very high up in the Andes. And the purple uh, flag is Mindo, which is a village in Ecuador, which that's where I've historically gone. It's an amazing place. But this last trip, I hired a, a tour guide who brought me down onto the eastern slope of the Andes. So this is my eastern slope trip. So all these blue um flags are the lodges where I stayed on the eastern slope of the Andes when I went and that's in the Amazon watershed so it's a very very different ecosystem than what I was used to um, up on the west side uh, of Quito so let's dive right in so to my um so this is on the east slope the Antiza Antisana Reserve which is a volcano and it last erupted 300 years ago, but the, the it's amazing. So all the roads in that area, uh, they used debris from the volcano to build the roads and they are still doing that. They're mining the debris from the volcano. It was a, it was a big one. So 12,000 feet, I was not expecting this, uh, it to be so cold, <laughs> but it was, and up, up um up on this volcano so my first step outside of the um outside let's keep muted here um I got off the plane and my my tour guide picked me up and she asked me is there anything you want to see right like what's your goal bird and I said so I know that it's really rare because it's a critically endangered species but I'd love to see an Andean condor so my tour guide was like, well, we'll just go see that first. So these are not good pictures. These are probably the worst pictures you're going to see during this, <laughs> during this slideshow. <laughs> but um, yeah, it was the first bird I saw on this trip. It was an Indian condor. Um, and those are the two, <laughs> the two best pictures I got of these guys because they were soaring quite, quite high above me. But if you don't know about condors, uh, the Andean condor has an 11 foot wingspan. So these were pretty far away. They just look like vultures flying around when they're far away, but they have a tremendous wingspan. So that was really exciting. First bird I saw, I was like, okay, I guess I can go home now. That was my, that was my target bird. But then I proceeded to see 170 more new species after the Andean condor. So, but so those are the worst bird pictures you're going to see, but it was kind of the, a very exciting moment. And I broke my sunglasses. Like as soon as I saw them, I sat on my sunglasses because I was so excited. Um, so other birds, better pictures. There are several in this area, birds that we call endemic. So an endemic animal is uh, unique to that one area. It's only found in one, one small area. So the Andean gull and Andean ibis, these are both species that are um, only found in this one, not 
just in that reserve where that volcano is, but they're very rare in this area. So the um, Andean ibis in particular, my, my guide was very, very excited that we got to see these because they're very difficult to see. So this was at almost the top of the volcano. Um, these, these were flying around. So that was a really special experience. And I'm seeing somebody in the chat. Oh, somebody just asked if people can mute um, as they come in. So, cause I, since I'm sharing, um, I'm not able to mute. Hey, Paul, how do you feel about being co-host? I can try, Mary. So just in case um, if 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 we need to mute people or something. Yeah, I can like message them directly or something like that. Yeah, so you can do that. Or I'll you do can that actually right mute them, which would be better. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so as co-host, you should be able to just like go in and mute somebody. Got it. Okay. And now I'm gonna mute you. <laughs> All right, so moving on from our endemic species. So I'm gonna go through like the different lodges where I stayed. I was trying to figure out how to um, organize this and I didn't wanna just like shoot just a ton of pictures of birds at you. I like to have a little bit of organization. So um, the Guango Lodge, this is the first lodge on the Eastern slope of the Andes where I stayed um, and very cool because it's right on the river. And <laughs> once we left the volcano, it got hot, right? So this is the Eastern slope. I mentioned that it's in the Amazon river watershed. So it's very muggy and hot. Um, which is different than my other experiences in Ecuador. Uh, as you get lower in elevation, it gets more humid. Um, so I was really excited about the torrent duck. This was another one on my on my list of things I wanted to see. And it's just a beautiful, a beautiful duck found um, near and in flowing water, friendly. All right, so more at this lodge. This was, um, sometimes lodges are kind of built around species of birds. <laughs> so the gray-breasted mountain toucan is pretty rare and they are just found in this one area. So this particular lodge kind of was built up around this particular species. So they can kind of draw people in because they can, um, show people this particular species. So they put out a little banana feeder and it kind of comes out of the woodwork to eat some bananas and then goes back in. You have to hike quite a ways up into the mountain um, to get to that to that spot. So that's always a, it's always fun to see something rare. This is not rare at all. Um, this is called a long-tailed sylph, which is a type of hummingbird. So the one with the long tail is the male and this other um, cutie is the female of that species. And it's, I found this particularly exciting because the female hummingbirds and birds in general are often um, plainer. They're, they're um, really just green and white and difficult to tell apart. So it was really neat to see this female hummingbird be so unique. Um, and colorful. And then this is the back. So this is the long-tailed sylph from the back, which is, it's, he's quite striking. And this is um, a different eco lodge, Rio Cuijo. People ask me if I speak Spanish and I don't. And I've been to South America probably half a dozen times now. And I, um, I don't speak Spanish. People say, well, how do you how do you talk to people? And I just don't really, I use my hand movements and I sit in the jungle most of the time. So uh, I just walk into the woods. So this, at this eco lodge, this is um, an Andean mot mot. So this is again, another one of those endemic birds that you can only see in, in certain spots. Anything that starts with Andean <laughs> means that it's really only found in those spots. And um, a really nice thing about down there, there's so many species that stay there all the time, right? 
like here we have this huge influx of birds in the spring they come up here to um, reproduce and but down there they have 1500 bird species and I think 1200 just stay there they're residents this is a man my computer the faceted tiger heron that was a cutie they dance they dance a little bit so at this lodge they had this little this little pool where this tide almost i think all the lodges we stayed at had little ponds grow like with fish whether it's trout or tilapia where they just farm the fish right on the property and then serve it in their restaurants so the herons of course are just it's like a feeding frenzy they have this um it's open pools so the herons will just go and hang out um next to the pools and wait for the food san isidro lodge this this is just a this is the driveway for the lodge going down in. Um, and this is just an example of, of one of the lodges. This particular trip, and I'm happy to share um, the details of the company that I used. They put me up, and this was unnecessary, but they put me up in the nicest places, which seemed a little bit like a waste because we would get there crash get up at 5 a.m and leave to go birding so um, but i was up in this little tower for this uh when we were at this spot for two nights and they have feeders at this lodge so um so we hung out there but yeah they put me up in the nicest spots it was a little unnecessary but so at the feeders this actually this is a green jay and they don't normally look like that, but it was raining hard <laughs> a lot. It is in the in the rainforest. So this actually I took with my phone, which I wanted to highlight just how at the feeders at these lodges, a lot of the birds are just so used to people that you can get really close with your phones um, to take pictures. So this particular spot, they have several different feeders um and they have a night feeder where they set up a white sheet with a light and then all the moths and stuff overnight go and they land on this sheet and then in the morning the birds come and eat the moths off of the sheet and it's like that's that's one of the types of feeders down there uh and then kind of the traditional there's some seed feeders and hummingbird feeders with nectar and then bananas um for a lot of the birds enjoy the bananas so it's this is a very common thing at the lodges the the jungle is so thick in places that to try and go and see all of these birds outside of this feeder situation would be very very difficult so it's a and it's a fun thing to do just sit at the feeders so i don't know how many people have have birded in south america but the ant pita there's a there's a um it's a whole group of of birds are renowned for their difficulty to see. And basically people have to beg the ampitas <laughs> to come out of the forest. Um, they hop, al hop along on the ground. They're very, very secretive. So this, this lodge had um, this little ampita feeder. So you go out into the woods and you have worms and you do this little call and you're, you're um, just trying to get these birds to come out and this particular day we went down with another group and it was raining and the birds were not coming out like you get to a point where you just give up they're not coming okay give up so this particular day my guide and i went down after lunch and it had stopped raining but usually they're out in the morning. So it's like, well, in the afternoon, they might not be out and all this stuff. So we sat there for a long time and she was making her little calls. And all of a sudden, this Aunt Pita comes hopping out of the forest and he's all wet and scraggly. And then this baby Aunt Pita came out. And this is a very, very rare occurrence such a special rare thing to see because getting one adult ant pizza to come out is very rare so it was amazing to have 
um, this adult bring their baby out to um, to feed them. So that was a one of the coolest experiences on this particular trip. Oh, and then I got a picture of this little butterfly on my hat. So the Ama Eco Lodge, this place was, <laughs> this is a picture of, again, this is the room where we, where they set me up, right? That this was just my room, had this on the porch. And I was like, when, <laughs> when am I supposed to use this? So some of these lodges, if you go down there, I would say stay for a week. And then it takes a full 24 hours to fill this tub up so that you can sit in it for for an hour after dinner but um and then this is just an example of a traditional meal um and so they wrap these this um fish in tilapia in banana leaves a couple of times they wrap it in banana leaves and then more and more banana leaves they put it directly into the fire and the outer leaves actually burn off and then they take it out and um, and unwrap it and you eat it just like that. So that was very cool. Also at this lodge, um, this was a really cool experience. So this is called a red capped cardinal, which I was like, come on, <laughs> really? That's weird. Um, but I had this experience where, and those of you that bird, or know about bird behavior, um, cowbirds, we have brown-headed cowbirds in Maine for part of the year, are parasitic nesters. So they will lay their eggs in the nests of other birds. And they've done studies and cowbirds, they, they don't make nests. Like they don't know how. Um, so they will lay their eggs in other birds' nests, often smaller birds. And the their egg hatches and it will either kill the other birds in the nest or they are so aggressive that they will get more food than the other babies and usually the other young in the nest don't survive and the adult birds just raise this cowbird as their own so this um is a video of this happening so this is a young cowbird and it's begging, right? So it's got its its wings. Um, they flap their wings when they're, oh gosh. Sorry, everybody. The video, I think the videos are just too much, but how cool is that? I'm gonna try again. Um, so, the babies will flap their wings when they are begging. And these adult cardinals just feed them. They, I don't know, Paul probably knows more about bird behavior than I do, but it, they seemingly don't, um, either don't know the difference or just don't care. It's kind of amazing. So that was a very cool experience. I'm going to try this. You want me to chime in with my two cents, Mary? It's probably an imprinting thing. So when they hatch out of their eggs, they're like automatically imprinted on the parents and the parents are then, you know, obligated to take care of them. Yeah. In a, in a simple model. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, um, so that was just, I've seen cowbird eggs in nests before. But I've I'd never seen that relationship between the adult bird and the and the young bird. So I don't want to. I saw that was up in northern Maine with a black throated green warbler feeding a juvenile bird that was at least twice, if not three times its own size. Yeah. And that will often happen with um, a smaller bird. So that's a shiny cowbird. We don't have we have brown headed cowbirds are common in Maine. But. So that was just kind of a unique experience. And um, this is, we went to this lagoon to see, uh oh, these are videos. So we'll see how that works. There we go. So we were looking for our very um, specific species down this, down this lake and we didn't find it. <laughs> so, um, so it was a sun grebe. 
and which are a really cool little bird or big bird, I should say. And we didn't find it, but that's okay. It was a beautiful day. It was hot. This is my bird guide, Natalia, and our driver, um, Alfredo. So the roads there are really sketchy. And so you really have to have a driver to, to get around. So we did see some interesting birds. This is my this is my camouflage bird. There's a bird in this picture and um and it is right up here at the top of this and some people maybe that have traveled in the tropics have seen these. Um this is called the common potu. And if you look at the top of that stick, that is um that's the bird. So very very well camouflaged. These are night birds. So they go out and hunt at night and during the day, they just kind of lay low and pretend that they are stumps uh, to avoid predators. And their eyes, you see the eyes are just huge because they are nocturnal birds. Here's another example of one just sitting on a, on a stump. And then I <laughs> had the privilege of seeing a, an adult and a baby potu uh, when I was down there. So this is a video, Let's see if it's gonna play. Oh geez, I hope I don't crash my computer. So that is a video and it is sped up. These, they do not move very fast. And it's, it's very rare during the day to see them moving around in particular. So uh, that was the East Slope part of my presentation. Uh, so now we're going to move back up through Quito, the capital city, and we're going to go up into Mindo Village, which this is um, <laughs> when I decided where to travel, those of you that use eBird, um, I went onto eBird and I looked for the red spots. So you can look at the whole world at any particular given time of year. And I can't travel much in the summer. Those of you that know what I do at LEA, it's just not really an option. But um, so I look at this map on eBird and I find the red spots. So it's like whatever, December, January time, where are the reddest places? And this particular village in Ecuador is like, it's a hot spot, right? So in Mindo, this is where I stayed, this lodge, and I stayed there for actually several days. So this was the only stop where I was there for several days. And it's a it's an eco lodge in Mindo, and they I actually arranged my tour, my Eastern Slope tour, through these folks. I would highly recommend if anybody is going to travel to South America to contact these folks, and I will. Um, I'm happy to share that information with people if they want it. So this is just the view from breakfast time um, and just sitting at breakfast. We see several different species. We've got um, a southern lapwing. This is a blue-necked tanager. Is that crazy one? There's a different tanager that has a bluer head than that somehow. So this one's a blue-necked tanager instead of a blue-headed tanager. And then we've got a choco toucan here in the um, in the oval. So that's just sitting, eating, you'll see those. So interestingly, there was a mot mot earlier in my presentation. There's several different species in the, um, in the country. And the really interesting thing about the East Slope is there's a bunch of birds that look the same as the West Slope or the top of the Andes but they're totally different species. So they look very similar. And this is one of the reasons why you really have to hire a bird guide when you're down there. I mean, just the sheer number of birds. And I've been there four times and I still would not feel comfortable um, or confident going down without a bird guide. So this is a Rufus Mott Mott. They always look angry to me, um, but maybe they are. So again, here's a banana, just dropped the whole banana on the ground, pretty wasteful. Um, 
So they set up these feeders for the birds. Um, this is the Paz de la Aves, which is a um, particular refuge down there. And this gentleman in the hat, in the sitting down in the hat, is named Angel Paz. And this is his property. And several years ago, uh, these these native people they owned this land. And they discovered, and I mentioned this earlier, that they had these really a bunch of unique species on their property. And Angel Paz created, a, he fostered a relationship with a particular bird. And um, I think I've got it. Let's skip the cock of the rock. because That's a video. And we don't want to. So this is a giant ant pita. And Angel Paz he developed this relationship with this giant ant pizza back several years ago and he so there were cock there was cock of the rock which is a really neat bird tons of different there's several ant pizzas all kinds of different trogons just a ton of different birds and he determined like okay either we sell the land to development to make money and survive, or we charge however much ahead for birders to come and see these birds. So they chose that, the latter. So they um, built all of these bird blinds and feeders and um, roads through these very, very particular places. And they charge some amount, I think it's like 30 bucks a day, maybe. And you can go throughout the whole refuge and um, and he will go out with you and call the birds. And to the ant pizza, he actually call, calls it. He says, venga, 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 which has come in Spanish. And he'll like try and call them in. And it totally works. So this is a video. There we go. So it works. So this is a giant ant pizza, which is quite big. A little bit it's smaller than a football but just barely and they do this creepy thing where they they become so still that it looks like a picture um because they're so so still <laughs> the giant ant pizza was a really cool bird and this was a species that angel paws created this relationship with back in the day we don't think it's the same bird like it's a new generation but he's created it's kind of incredible, like how they will come when he calls. And, um, but you can see the little worms, they put worms out for them. And, um, and it's just really amazing. You kind of like when they come out of the forest, you just kind of hold your breath and everybody's like, <gasps> like nobody move because you don't want to spook them. Okay. <sighs> All right. I'm just going to. Switch to the next page. So just these are some other um, uh, species of ant, of ant pita that I saw on in that particular reserve. And they are really neat with their, their naked legs and the way they move. Um, and so all of these, you have to like crawl down into the, they will not come to feeders at the lodge, right? So you gotta like crawl down into the woods and be very patient. And um, yeah, look out for them. Oh, I have a video of this ochre-breasted dancing. They just can't help it. This is um, a couple of masked trogons. This male one had this nasty tick on his face, which I think I you could just see it at the beginning of the video. But so the one with the red and green as the male and the brown as the female. And these are residents. So they nest um, down there. And there's not really a like a nesting season, really, because the climate basically stays the same all the time. So at any particular time, something could be nesting around you. And um, it's interesting, those of you that bird up here, we highly frown upon using callback like play black back where you play the song of a bird to call it in particularly during our um 
mating season here, right, in the spring and summer, because we don't want to confuse the birds because they're so set on, on reproducing at this time. We don't want to confuse them. Well, down there, it's just, I mean, the mating season, again, is all the time. So the guides down there use um, call back and they call in, they whistle to the birds and they actually use their songs on their phones um, to call the birds in. And it's a very, very common practice um, down there. So at the first couple of times I was like, oh, ew. because when, when I lead our bird walks, we don't use, we don't use playback. Um, if you come with me this spring, that's not, not something we do, but down there, it's very common. Oh, and here's my nerd picture of me at the reserve with all my cameras and my binoculars and my pants tucked into my socks and which did not at all prevent the bites. Um, I'm very sensitive to a particular bug down there. No matter what I do, they get me every single time. So this last time I actually just stopped tucking my pants into my socks because it didn't, didn't do anything. But Again, this is that same place where they basically designed this whole experience for birders. So people come from all over the world to see these particular species um, in this in this one place, and they've they've built this world around that and are able to preserve their own land and actually buy up more land with the money they get from us um, bird nerds. So it works out very well, um, both for the birds and the natives down there, as well as us. So just some species of tanagers. Again, those of you that bird in Maine, we have one tanager that comes here in the summertime to, to mate, which is the scarlet tanager. And down there, there's just like dozens of different species of, of tanager. So these are um, black capped, Tanagers, so the male is the one with the darker head and the female. And then we've got, oh, sorry, my computer's stalling out. We've got our golden tanager, our golden nape tanager there. These are all at that one place. Oh, these are videos. <laughs> Barrel spangled tanager and summer tanager. We do occasionally have summer tanagers in Maine, um, those red ones. They don't nest here necessarily, but we do have summer tanagers come here sometimes. So you maybe have seen those up here. The barrel spangled tanager are, are unique to that, to that region. Um, and one of my favorites, the flame face tanager is quite striking. And then I think the next one, I just, bleh, I just was like, I'll just put a bunch of hummingbirds on there. So there's over a hundred species of hummingbird in Ecuador. And my guides always laugh when I say, well, we have one sometimes, but so these are, are very common at the feeders down there. Um, all of these, these species are common down there. And these are all... I think these are all male. And again, the female usually are just kind of brown and, or green and, and white. And then this one, so it was so interesting, right? These super colorful hummingbirds and the sylph with the purple tail and everything, so unique, right? And then this bird flew up and sat on this on this tree on this stem and my guide lost her mind and she was just so excited she's like get a picture of that like put your camera on that and she was so excited and it's called a hoary puff leg and i was like what's the big deal so this is the um the map right that little gray stripe there next to the um next to the star. So the star is Quito, the city. And then um, <laughs> that little stripe is where those are found. So it was extremely rare. You don't often see them at the feeder. So it was really, really special to see that bird. And this is an example of um, 
you know, we get so distracted by these really bright birds. And a lot of times that's what people are after when they go down there. They want the toucans, they want the hummingbirds, they want the parrots and things like that. But then this region is home to some very unique birds um, that are very rare. Uh, just in 2000, and I think it might have been five, maybe, they discovered a new species of bird in Ecuador. <laughs> Like just in, there's a whole new species and that does not happen very often at all. So it's a very, it's a very special place um, with a lot of unique life. The sign it, <laughs> cinnamon flycatcher. This is pretty common, but just adorable. So I had to share. I call this slide constant vigilance because they, their head is just always on a swivel. Like they never stop moving. Um, and I saw those through, I mean, they're very common throughout. So I saw them on the East Slope trip and then in Mindo and that the whole area, they're very common, they're widespread. So I don't know if you remember from earlier since we had to stop a million times, um, but I had the gray breasted mountain toucan was what I saw on the East Slope trip. And then the plate build mountain toucan is um, on the western side. So, and this is a, another example of somebody. Um, this one's called the Bird Watcher's House, and they have built this whole compound around the plate build mountain toucan. I'm not kidding. So, this pool, they built a reflecting pool with a bird blind. So, you sit in the bird blind, and there's this pool, and they put the bananas on. Um, I'm hesitant to start this because it's a video, but they put the bananas on the other side of the of the moss and the toucans. And this is this is I mean, all kinds of different birds come down. Um, but this is the rock star and this is the one that's really um, unique to this area. They have now put up nest boxes for them and they're nesting on their property, like just right where everybody gathers. And um, this is another example of people protecting their land and preserving their land around these birds. Um, so they do whatever they can to make them happy, which is kind of cute. There's orchids down there too. I thought I would include the fact that it's not just birds. Um, there are wild orchids everywhere. And I met this last bird guide that I worked with. She knew what a few of them were, but there's just so many different species, um, both in people's gardens, but also just in the wild, you'll just be walking down a, a hiking trail and there will be orchids growing all around you. And this is where the whole hundred species of hummingbird comes in, right? Um, we don't have this variety of, of food source uh, year round. And there's so many um, flora to go with the fauna. It's pretty incredible. All right, next, trying to be, oh, the Amaguza Preserve. All right. So this is um, a preserve outside of Mindo. And so again, unique species. Um, this is a toucan barbet. Hopefully this video works. I'm like, so, right? So this is one of those species that is unique to this area. And you have to wait really patiently at the feeder and go at a very particular time of day and all of it. And you're just kind of catering, catering to this bird, but it's obviously a really neat looking bird. So it's worth it. And then this looks like, as far as the tanagers are concerned, it looks a little bit plain um, compared to some of the other tanagers. Like it doesn't have a ton of different colors. It's called the glistening green tanager. But I'm telling you, I swear to you, it glows in the dark. Like it's a, this is a, it's cloudy all the time there. I mean, you're, it's literally the cloud forest. It's cloudy all the time. And this thing comes down and it's like a beacon, right? So its feathers just catch every single tiny um, bit of, of sunlight. So it was really, that one was quite the catch. And they're very particular 
um, they're at particular elevations. So they need to be at a particular elevation. And here, similar, um, this was in the same place as the glistening green tanager and ne again needs that particular elevation in order to, um, that's where they are found. Orange breasted fruit eater. This was kind of a cool one. Looking down, that's a male and a female. So the female is the one with the berries and the male um, is the more colorful one. So again, this is that gray strip towards the top is that's the range where it's found. And that is that's hugging this um, this elevation. Uh, like I think it was 5,500 feet. So um, I always love it when I see unique birds. Oh, and this is a video. Ah, okay. So this is an example of one of those feeders where you can get a huge variety of birds. So we've got a lemon rump tanager, which is the black one with the lemon rump, golden tanager at the top, um, and then the flame face tanager that we already saw. And then these are mm, black headed tanagers. I'll have to look that up. Oh, my dog is listening to the squeaking of this video and freaking out. All right. So birding around Mindo, if you ever go to this village, it's incredible. So it's in this valley. Um, this is what the village looks like. I guess that's a lot of power lines, but it's very, very sweet. Um, a little bit touristy, but it really is designed around birding so it's got a lot of little restaurants it's i feel totally safe just walking around down there um i do all of these travels have been solo and um feel very safe there so these are just a few examples just walking around the town um the, the they do have a couple of woodpeckers down there that look people are like oh pileated woodpecker uh, but it's not. So there's a couple that, that remind us of what we have at home, but are not the same. Uh, and all of these things are, we have a blue gray gnat catcher here. We have, a, a Northern Perula. We have our, um, native vireos to here and our native green heron, which is similar to that. So it's, it's very interesting to see the birds that look similar um but aren't so you think you like i look at something i think i know what it is and it's just not but i did come across these guys so we do have some familiar faces um house wren swainson's thrush swainson's thrush are really really common down there throughout all of my trip, various elevations everywhere. Blackburnian warbler. That's actually the best picture of a Blackburnian warbler I've ever gotten, despite the fact that they come and nest here in the woods behind my house every year. Um, and then the cattle egret, I just had to take that because it's such a cliche, right? Cattle egret um, on the cattle. So this is a, a closer picture of the cattle egret. And these are all birds that we would see here at home. 10 minutes. Ooh, don't upset the, the computer. Oh, I did include just some bugs because bugs are cool. Just weird bugs, funky cricket. And then the glass wing butterflies, of course, are those are all over the place. Yeah. Um, there is a butterfly garden there, but they um, which is neat but the glass wing butterflies are, are more in the wild. So you have to um, be in the woods to see those. So these are just some examples. It's not just birds. Um, I try to be a little bit well-rounded when I'm down there and notice, notice everything, right? And that's what we do here in Maine as well is you wanna look and see everything. Oh, and these are cool. So these are leafcutter ants, and that's a video. And let's see, there we go. So that's just a video that I set up just in the woods. And it's incredible. They, de they defoliate a tree. And it's really 
funny, I don't know if you can see in this top picture, there's, um, there's an ant riding on another leaf. So they'll actually like a bigger ant will be carrying the leaf and a smaller worker ant will just ride it down. Um, so they all cut it. And that anyway, it's just, it's really funny. And then this last trip that I took, um, I found one and they um, carrying, they'll shred up um, flowers as well and carry the, the petals around. Oh, I got my Hall of Fame. So these are just um, terrible pictures of birds. Um, there's the racket tail. That's hot chocolate. So they had it almost right that it was sugar. Um, I didn't see it actually try to drink it, but it did land on that. Here's our Andean cock of the rock, which is a really neat bird. And that is the best picture I got of that one. I think the next one isn't a bird. I would say maybe six times I looked at this one thing and thought it was a bird each time. Like it would, I would like out of the corner of my eye, I would be like, oh, there's a bird. And it never was. So I ended up taking a picture of it because it just was, it fooled me so many times. This is a super rare trogon, which I didn't even get a picture of its whole body. So I was in the Choco region of Ecuador. Uh, so again, this is endemic to this area. And so that's the best picture I got. I keep it because it's the best picture I got, but not winning any awards. The sun bittern, beautiful bird, absolutely gorgeous. Um, I would highly recommend just Googling that one because, again, that picture is anyway. But it's a beautiful bird, and I'm glad that I got a picture at all. Um, Zeladon's Ant Wren. Uh, that's the best picture I got of that. I would also re recommend looking that up because it's got like a bright blue spot around its eye, which is very cool. It took, I would say, 15 minutes to find this bird and get this picture of it. And my bird guide was very excited that we ended up finally getting a picture of it, um, trying to kind of not chase it. But and it was staying in like a similar place, but just hopping around and um, it was difficult to get to get a picture of. Purple thornbill. This is the hummingbird with the shortest bill in Ecuador. It's got a tiny little thornbill. That's the best picture I got of that one. Um, and then a chestnut fronted macaw, which um, they're very hard to see in the wild and never get a pet parrot. Thanks um because that is awful so i did see a couple species of macaw on this last trip and this is the best one i got of that i actually had to climb through a barbed wire fence into an enclosure with cows which i don't have a lot of experience in close proximity to cows so i was a little bit nervous about that and that's still the best shot i got trying to get closer to these um to these birds i did have permission from the landowner it was three little kids so um we we just took that as permission from these from these three young children and this was another situation where i mean these super rare birds are just nesting on their property and they just don't know and they're they're not tuned into the birds and this last trip that i went on on the eastern slope um the level of poverty was very striking um and the people are just amazing and this one woman she just opened up her home they were doing the christmas bird count i don't know if anybody here i think this might be the end i'm gonna stop sharing and just tell tell this one story um and i'll start my video so that i can use my hands um so they did the Christmas bird count down in this region and they win every year. So we, on our Christmas bird count this year, I think we had 45 or 46 species. I don't know if anybody on the call um, helped me with that, but if you're interested, I manage it for our area. And uh, so down there, I think they had about 400 species for the Christmas bird count. So that's like one day of counting birds. And 
this woman, they just kind of spread the word to people in the area to say like, hey, if you have any birds on your property, let us know. And the this woman, she had this really cool owl nesting behind her house, right? Just random owl. Um, and so reached out during the Christmas bird count. It got counted for the bird count. And then we went, my guide and I went and it's, you know, there's no windows, dirt floor, the whole, it, it was, they were really um, just very poverty stricken. And she was so excited to bring us into the woods behind their house. And, um, and then you, and then we, of course, of course, give them money, which makes a huge difference in their lives. But that was just, they just live on the side of the road. I mean, that wasn't a preserve. It was just, that was their property. So there were a couple of instances like that where people just, they're like, oh yeah, we've got this rare bird <laughs> living behind our house. And they just open it up to people and and invite people onto their property. So it, uh, this last time, which is my fourth time down there was, um, in that different region on the Eastern slope where it's warmer, it's muggier, it's in the Amazon watershed, um, the level of poverty, which was much higher than on the other side, which is where that village of Mindo is. So Mindo is really kind of the, this birding capital of South America. And it's very cent like centered around ecotourism. And they've, they've developed that and been able to, um, profit off of that. And then there's these other spots in Ecuador that they don't have that, um, that part of their economy has not been developed. So we're, we're, we were lucky that these folks are holding onto their property as well as they can, uh, because the, the alternative of course is, is selling it and logging it and using up its resources. Um, so there's a couple of things in the chat, everybody just, you know, comforting me about the, um, about all everything stopping next year. We'll do this in person. Um, so one of the questions is the official name, cool orange bug. It is not, um, it is hard enough to figure out the names of the birds down there. Um, some of these bugs, they, they, <clears throat> they haven't been discovered. <laughs> it's just like this random bug that I saw down by this waterfall in the middle of nowhere. So, um, the bugs of Ecuador book was not, I don't know if that's a thing. And, um, I didn't have access to that. So, yeah. So hey, I have a couple of questions because I have to go, but yes, no, please. Paul. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. I've been waiting for a long time to see some of your pictures from your trips. So, you know, fantastic. I'm, I'm beside myself with jealousy. Okay. Um, <laughs> but two quick questions. First, what's your, uh, your like world life list at? And second, the, you, in a couple of cases with these like really strict endemics, you showed some maps. What were the sources for those maps? So the map is the Birds of Ecuador book. I actually just took a picture of the, of the book. Um, and so it's this thick, um, and it's got beautiful color plates. So if anybody, if you ever go to Ecuador, just ask me and I'll loan it to you. Um, but I would highly suggest it. And then sometimes I just sit down and read it because it's really fun. Um, what was your other question? Did you have another? Oh, the birding. Hang on. I'll, um, I'll tell you I've got eBird. I still, as of like last week, I was still putting, um, putting birds into my eBird account. I'm at 873. Nice. So your entire life list is an eBird? Yes. Okay, cool. I'm, I'm not there yet, but that's, that's really impressive. Kudos to you. <laughs> Thank you. So does anybody, um, so Cindy, can someone tell me what book Mary was talking about? So I'm just going to um, get it because it's right on my bookshelf. Pink to do Birds of Ecuador. Oh, look at the plate build mountain toucans right on the cover. Yay. Yep. So it has color plates, which, and this is blasphemous, but it is a very common thing that people do. But I cut the color plates out of the middle of the book and brought it with me down there. Um, and then the rest of the book, it just has, 
you know, an entry for each bird with the map of where they're found. And um, yeah, so that, and it's, it is, it's 1500 some odd species and of varying rarities. Okay, yeah, that's the, that's the book I got. And I guess that's typical. So you just read a lot before you go down there and then, and then you have the plates with you or did you? Yeah, it? yeah. So I'll look it over. And then also, are you on eBird, Cindy? Yeah. Cause okay, because I'll go back. in and I'll, and I, you can actually like the lodges that I went to, you can print out a list of all the birds that have been seen in that spot. Okay, great. And so then you can go through it. Like I'm going to be in this place. So then you can ignore the birds in here that you're definitely not going to see. Right. So you, you have this list of birds that have been seen in this area. You can look at that, look at the plates, figure out what they look like. Still hire an English speaking bird guide. <laughs> Because yeah. no matter how much you study them, um, you you can get close. You can say that you know like what what group or family that's from. But having that bird guide is really critical. Oh yeah, I mean I'm in that guide. But sometimes I look at the pictures on the plates and I'm like, I can't tell the difference until I read the description. Yeah. Like, why is this different? <laughs> why? Well, and and that's one of the interesting things that I mentioned is on either side of the Andes, right? East slope, west slope. They'll have like the same tanager with just a little tiny bit different markings, or maybe one's a little bit smaller than the other one, or something. And they've te they've tested them. You know, they the genetically they are different. They are a different species, but they look very similar. And it's such a cool example of evolution, right? So like, it they have a common ancestor, and then they got to these different sides of the of the mountains, and just the population changed and evolved into something else. So. Um, but yeah, it's hard to tell the difference, but if you know where you're going to be, then you can drastically narrow down what species it's possible to see. Right. Um, and then you can just kind of put out of your mind some of the, the ones that are, um, you're just not going to see. <laughs> and it'll tell you in that list, you can actually, it'll rank from most common, like what you're actually likely to see down to the ones like on the list where that one bird was seen there one time in 1982. <laughs> so it's like, it's on the list of birds that have been seen in that place, but it's not likely to, to see it. So bye, Paul. Um, how did I find my guides? So that lodge that I mentioned, um, Las Terrazas de Dana, which is located in Mindo. I, I just, looked at Mindo, looked at bird lodges, and they do um, guided tours through that, through there, including trips to the Galapagos um, Islands is, is one of the tours that they do. Okay. So I've, I've used them several times, but most of the bird lodges down there have, have guides on staff. So if you're going down, you're staying in a certain area, you can look at the bird um, lodges in that in, around there, but I'd be happy to share information about um, that particular lodge, it's located in Mindo. And then they drove me all the way down to the East slope. And we spent a week, um, stay hopping around to different spots. Um, Cindy asked, did I go, I did go to the Galapagos islands in 2016. That was my first trip to Ecuador was for the islands and which are neat. And as a naturalist, historically significant, right? Um, given Darwin's work there, but it's pretty barren. <laughs> like I saw some really cool species and endemic species that you're not going to see anywhere else and the tortoises and the iguana swimming and all of those, but it's pretty barren. Um, there's not a lot of biodiversity. So I spent one day on mainland Ecuador before I flew home from, from that Galapagos trip and I was hooked. I did one half bird day <laughs> and I was like, okay. Um, yeah, Cindy, we can, we can totally chat if you want to stay on or, or we can email if you want to make a list of questions, um, you can shoot me an email for sure. Does anybody else have any other questions? Yeah. Um, I'm wondering, this is Nandia. I'm wondering, um, where else 
in the world you've done birding and um is ecuador pretty much your happy place <laughs> so i do get into ruts you know like what you order at a restaurant and also where you travel because <laughs> you get comfortable so i've been um mostly south america so costa rica guatemala trinidad ecuador and i'm missing one um and then i've traveled some internet everywhere i go i go birding you know it's just part of it so i've traveled some to europe and um but it's not terribly rich but i have started my little savings account to go to kenya it's going to be my next big trip so if you look at ebird that's what i did i said where in the world can i go next to to um find as many birds as possible in a short amount of time because people are like you got to go for at least a month well um as somebody who works at a small nonprofit and i'm in my 30s i can't take a month off from work to go to kenya um so saving up to do kind of a, a couple week trip there um is next on the list oh somebody said madagascar so Borneo is definitely on the list for Birds of Paradise, of course. Um, Madagascar has unique endemic species. So right, so like those I the islands are are gonna have species that are unique to there that have developed and evolved in those places, which is awesome and unique. Um, the only thing with that, and this is just awful. And if you read my article in the British News, it's the birding versus bird watching, right? So there's not a lot of species on Madagascar. <laughs> like as far as volume of, of different species you're gonna see, there's not a lot. So if I wanna maximize like the different birds that I see, I have to like, there's like national parks in Kenya is the way to go. There's parts of like Indonesia, Philippines um, where you can maximize that. I, my aunt, I think, um, is from Madagascar. So we do have some connections there. So if I ever retire, <laughs> um, that is certainly on my list to see those places. I would love to go see the birds of paradise um, in Papua New Guinea, but um, that's very far away. <laughs> so any other questions? Michael, I can't hear you which is weird because I don't believe you're muted. No dice. You can, you can type it in the chat or you can message me. Yeah. Um, any other questions? I might go eat some dinner. If people don't have any questions, you can always email me. Um, and again, I, I, I love sharing. I do have my, this is my little bird book that for now has, it starts um, in 2017. So I started my, my bird booking um, in 99 in high school. I went to the Everglades and, um, and started my, my bird book. So if you have any young people in your life, this is a really fun way. Um, I think birds are so special. So it's a really fun way to kind of get them um, obsessed with something is to show them just like the possibilities. So if you don't have an eBird account and you are interested in that, I would highly suggest it. You can see like who the top eBirders in the world are. The guy that I think has the most species, he has 9,000 species on his life list. So it's pretty, um, it's pretty special uh to to be on there and you can compare yourself to other people and um so and then also as far as birds are concerned um may i do a weekly bird walk every i think we did mondays last year like monday morning in bridgeton so if you're around and you want to do that um then please um hit me up and we'll be sending out messages about that as well. And that's just for migration purposes. Um, and we do see some of the, some of the birds here that I see down there, the warblers um, come up here. 
So, and then, maybe, um, I, yeah, I'm responding to one direct message and then I am just going to sign off. So thank you everybody for coming. And um, if you have any questions, shoot me an email. Thank you so much.